As coronavirus spreads across the African continent, with it comes fear and doom. The predominant Western media coverage of COVID-19 has been racialized, resulting in mass hysteria, which is now fueling xenophobia. An estimated 1 million Chinese people live and work on the African continent. Many now face added scrutiny or outright discrimination. Chinese ethnicity is being used by some sections of the media to describe the virus. This racialization is a narrow view of inferiority towards darker races which are seen as disease carriers. Hence we hear about African swine fever, Middle East respiratory syndrome, China coronavirus and Japanese encephalitis. Furthermore, the continuous China bashing by US President Donald Trump is a narrow framing of a global pandemic in a time when the world needs leadership, not posturing, when compassion, collaboration and common sense should triumph over politicking. Today, we speak to two South African politicians and unpack this new wave of xenophobia on the African continent. Joining us first is Mohammed Khalid Sayed. He's a provincial member of parliament in the Western Cape for the African National Congress and chairperson of the ANC Youth League in the Western Cape. What do you believe the impact of this has been on the African continent generally and South Africa specifically? The outbreak of COVID-19 in China from the very onset uh, when it took place even before it spread to South Africa and to the African continent, immediately conjured up some of the Western myths and narratives around China. Really, really crass and baseless and kind of uh, myths that you would associate with the, with the same European and American stereotypes that are there around the African continent. So it was very shocking and surprising on the onset that even black South Africans and black people on the continent, and those who are also dispossessed and marginalized by that very same agenda of stereotype, and those who are victimized by the very type of racism, also fell for some of these kind of narratives. You had the narrative around, no, it, uh, it started in China because the people eat everything and anything. They eat bats, for example. And that whole theory has been debunked. That is because of the eating of bats. But yes, and that's the one. You had also, particularly in the Muslim communities, um, and I, I can speak quite openly because I'm from the Muslim community. You had in the Muslim communities in South Africa and even in the rest of Africa, where it was said, no, this is the punishment from God against the Chinese because of the oppression of the Uyghur people. So, and also, that also is a Western narrative. These are all the narratives that the West has been trying to use to undermine China and to actually undermine the role China has been trying to play in terms of assisting the development of Africa, standing with the developing world, and in, in a sense, standing with the non-aligned world, or those who want a free and more just world against Western hegemony and imperialist hegemony. So the COVID-19 conflict or the, the, the COVID-19 context was most certainly used and abused by the Western powers for that. And actually, once it started to spread, it actually became worse, actually. Uh, they then started to say, can you see now, this has spread to you because of China. China has brought this. We've seen the kind of statements made by Donald Trump, the victimization even of Americans who are of Chinese descent. Even if you look Chinese, you are then victimized. In South Africa, the same thing we have seen playing itself. It was very dangerous, as I say, those who would act upon it and be, in a sense, victims of this narrative and passive victims, but then actually going and perpetrating the aggression in terms of the talk and the language would actually be even those who are marginalized as part of the divide and rule. But also, 
also on a more critical level to say that I think some of the actions or of, 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 uh, over the years, not necessarily by the Chinese government, but even Chinese people also, has also fueled this. Not saying that they've done these things during COVID, but there have been in, in China, we've received reports as well of the fact that there have been uh, Africans living in China that are discriminated against uh, because of COVID-19 issues, but also uh, a long-standing kind of discrimination uh, against Africans on the part of many Chinese people in the same way that, and not all Chinese, but many, in the same fashion uh, from what we have seen on the part of white people towards black people. So those things added have also allowed the Western media and the Western powers to basically exploit the situation and to fuel uh, what we now call Sinophobia. I actually want to follow up on your last point, um, and that's just kind of to do a comparison between what we've seen in terms of uh, Africans being attacked in, in China, and we've uh, spe specifically seen it, and, and there obviously are the context, context to it. Um, but if we look at it very plainly, it is, is ordinary citizens uh, within China uh, in some way or form that were, you know, sort of attacking um, Africans that, that live there. Now, if we juxtapose that with what we've seen in the last week and a half evolve in the United States, there's also been an attack on, on Africans or people of African descent, um, or, you know, specifically in the United States. What do you think, if you were to just do a comparison between the outrage um, towards not the American people or the Chinese people, but the American government versus the Chinese government with, and, and how that's played out, whether it is in our media or, or just broadly speaking. I do think that the outrage um, around the racism on the part of Americans and racism and prejudice on the part of certain Chinese people in in light of a really, really panic situation in China, life and death situation. We're not justifying it. But I do think that there's been an imbalance in terms of the outrage. Yes, very clear, civil society, everyone has unanimously gone and taken a stance on the racism happening in America. Fine, and I think there in the broader sense, there's been more of an outrage in terms of the street the popular street against the American racism and against those few odd skirmishes that has happened in China. And I think that for me is a positive sign because it means that despite the narrative that the Western black media hopes to portray, uh, there's more of a popular sentiment of resentment, not only against the American people who did this, but against the American government because Donald Trump supports what has happened. The statements he has made in the aftermath, he's clamping down on the protests, clear. And I think there's been more of a popular resentment and outrage against Donald Trump than what there's been against the Chinese government. And I think people have seen that because people have seen that it's not the Chinese government that told certain Chinese citizens to discriminate against Africans. People have seen through that, despite the kind of imbalance that I'm talking about in terms of the narrative. The narrative portrayed by the mainstream media, the narrative portrayed by the US government itself, the narrative portrayed by the allies has been a different one, but the street, what we've seen in the popular imagination of people has not been one. Even people who have been critical, even of the Chinese government, and some of its approaches and the way in which it operates in the African continent, for example, even from those people, they have, they have been very clear in terms of opposing the US government on this and not really laying the blame on the Chinese government for what has happened there. So I, I, I actually think uh, in, 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 in some sense that in the context of COVID, but also in the context of what had just happened now last week, there is a sense of a reawakening and a rejection of an orchestrated racist narrative that is being portrayed.
Um, so in terms of uh, South Africa, South Africa obviously has received uh, quite a number of uh, quite substantial assistance from different countries. We've seen uh, Cuban doctors uh, and medical professionals uh, uh, in assistance in, in that regard. And then we've also seen assistance given from, from China in terms of their intellectual capital, as well as actually, you know, uh, whether it is masks or ventilators or wh whatever it may be. Um, do you think that has helped uh, to, to combat this narrative and, and specifically the rise of, of, of xenophobia here at home? I think in a sense that the South Africans facing their own challenges around COVID-19, the hardships even around the lockdown, um, the, the reality of death uh, has to some extent shifted the focus away from an anti-China sentiment and the fact that it has been quite widely publicized that the Chinese government has been assisting and has come forward and the China is also playing a role at the WHO and people have seen uh, the manner in which those who are antagonistic towards China like Donald Trump, like Boris Johnson, like Bolsonaro in Brazil, the, the, the popular mass in South Africa has taken heed of that and have started to see that. So people are starting to see who South Africa's real friends are. The danger that we however have here is that um, there's still an agenda. There's an agenda, the agenda on the part of white business in this country, white business that has been running a monopoly and exploiting our people in this country and their political cohorts, mm -hmm. their political landscape, will still and are still trying to push back on that particular aspect. Even though, for example, if I look at the Western Cape, where they govern, where the Democratic Alliance governs, for example, they accept the assistance from the Chinese government. They go for ceremonies, they receive the assistance, but politically you'll still find the undertone that's being pushed of an anti-China narrative. Say, no, look, we've got this because of China. Chinese assistance coming here is not in goodwill, it's that the Chinese can further use this virus to entrench themselves. But I do think that the manner in which China has been carrying itself, and even admitting to some of the mistakes in the build-up to the virus, has most definitely brought a sense of greater confidence amongst South African people in the intentions of the Chinese government. So if we were to look at South Africa's international relations, um, we've obviously seen a, a concerted push in, in mainstream media, uh, whether it is South African media or, or international media, on uh, relations with China, on what, uh, you know, the, the net impact of, of having really good relations with China is the fact that uh, we have COVID-19 all over, all, over, all over the world. That's kind of a narrative that has been pushing, Do you th or being, being pushed. Do you think this has had some sort of impact on, um, or will have some sort of impact on our foreign policy going forward, just in terms of our relations with China? South Africa, particularly, uh, during the time of President Jacob Zuma, heightened and strengthened its relations with China. Even before that, we had good relations. We continue to have our relations are historic in nature. Uh, the Chinese um, really assisted the liberation movement, not only the African National Congress, but actually even more so in certain instances, the Pan-Africanist Congress. Mm. So, and there's an ideological linkage. Uh, the work that China has been doing in terms of development here, and even taking heed of some of the critiques that we have had as South Africans. And we are not going to be an outpost of China as South Africa, and I don't think that that's the case. Mm. We have seen, however, in the new administration, uh, due to certain pressures and certain narratives and balancing acts, and I think finding its feet, we have seen a bit of a pushback in terms of some of the strategic relations with China. But in a sense, COVID-19, despite the narrative that's being pushed, despite the extreme anti-Chinese sentiment that is being driven, COVID-19 
and the lessons that we have been able to draw from China and the assistance that China is giving. Uh, COVID-19 actually, in some respects, has got the ability to actually strengthen South African relations with China, even post this particular virus, and even during this particular virus, uh, because it's really juxtaposed to the American approach. And listening even, listening even to the remarks being made by our president, our Minister of Health and others, one can see that even in South Africa there's a policy rethink on the issue of China. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to end off, um, from a South African media perspective, uh, very often when, when we do media reports, uh, a lot of the international stories we get from the big mainstream media outlets, specifically in the West, do you think that South African media has done enough to curb uh, the regurgitating or to avoid those pitfalls of merely regurgitating what seems or could be uh, anti-China sentiment in, in our media? The South African media uh, for, a, for a long time, and, I, and, I, and when I speak about South African media, I don't want to generalize. I understand that the South African media space is quite diverse. So I would say in terms of the mainstream, well-funded media, um, there has been a particular negative narrative about China. But I must say that as I've said earlier, that given the, given the, the rise of COVID-19, and given the manner in which Donald Trump has exposed himself as an antagonist of China, but also as a racist, as someone that's insular and is completely cavalier in the approach towards COVID-19. Given the assistance, as I said, that the Chinese have been bringing and the exchanges and the engagements, I would say that even in the mainstream media, there has been a shift uh, towards the coverage or around the coverage um, around uh, China and also South African Chinese relations, and I don't get a sense of that same antagonistic narrative uh, that there was before compared to what there is now. Um, in, for, for example, there's been more space given even in the mainstream media to people who want to write, presenting a completely counter narrative to what the media in itself was presenting. And there's more balanced reporting, I think. I'm just hoping that uh, this will continue post-COVID. A recent study undertaken by Dr. Muhammad Shaban Rafi from the University of Management and Technology in Lahore, Pakistan, investigated the impact of the language used to report on COVID-19 and specifically its narrative in perpetuating the discourse of fear and the eventual rising of anti-Chinese sentiment. This particular study found that the language utilized by mainstream media, specifically in the West with regards to China, was a discourse of fear, eventually painting China as the archetypal boogeyman. To unpack this and more, we are joined by Economic Freedom Fighters Member of Parliament, Nazir Paulson. What do you believe is the impact of this has had on the African continent generally and South Africa specifically? Well, I believe that the, it is not the, the, the American sentiment that has affected Africa as much as the Chinese attitude towards Africans itself. I think it's unfortunate that um, Corona is used to heighten tensions in the world and and to increase the and to try and in, uh, increase and induce anti-China sentiment. And I think you know China has been the target of of all sorts of um, sanctions since 2019. I mean, it's there's no other country that has endured more. Uh, from the West than the Chinese, and this is unfortunate because um, I believe that we can learn so much from China as a developing country and a country that has, you know, that has developed without the the assistance of Western countries. But I think what has affected the anti-Chinese sentiment is the Chinese treatment of Africans in China. So. But fortunately, we've had a very different type of response 
to this racism from the Chinese government compared to the type of response we we get to anti-African, anti-African American uh, racism in America. We've had a very different response, a more uh, matured and uh, decisive leadership to address the issue of racism in China. So I would think that going forward, you know, we should engage with the Chinese, you know, and these issues, the issues of racism should be um, uh, dealt with head on, as opposed to trying to, to steer clear from it. Okay, cool. So in, in the context of, of COVID-19, obviously we've seen that countries across the world have been helping each other. In South Africa's specific instance, um, we've seen Cuban doctors and other medical professionals from Cuba coming, coming to South Africa. And we've seen China also, one, exporting some of the intellectual capital in terms of their uh, way of, uh, of having managed the virus. Um, so. Do you think that, in terms of, of just that level of assistance that has been offered, do you think that has helped curb xenophobia in, in the African continent? Or do you think it's risen substantially, or specifically because of COVID-19 and, and what people perceive to be its origin? Uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that, uh, that the virus um, is first recorded in China. You know, there are other viruses recorded around the world and we don't go and target that particular country for, for starting the spread of a virus. And I don't think we should even do that now. I don't think we should ever do that. It's unfortunate any form of virus. We can't hold people responsible. But what we, the upside of this is, is that nations, societies will be more cautious as to, um, in terms of hygiene, and more conscious about their own personal hygiene. And I think, you know, you can take it from yourself, you're more concerned now, you go out and have I touched anything, have I cleaned my hands, all of those sort of things, maintaining social distance. I think those are the upside of this particular virus is we are more conscious about viruses now and also limiting the spread of viruses. Um, it is unfortunate that there are countries or governments even, world leaders, that tries to pin this particular virus on a particular nation. Now is not the time for this. Now is the time for global solidarity like that shown by the Chinese towards African nations, not just South Africa, but towards other African nations as well. And the solidarity is shown by Cubans, not just to Africa and South Africa, but to countries around the world. Now is the time for social solidarity. It is not the time for any form of phobia towards any, any nation. So do you think from a governmental perspective that South Africa's uh, sort of international relations will evolve or change, one, within the context of COVID-19, but two, in the context of our specific trade with China and this notion that uh, COVID-19 emerged out of China, what does that mean for our relations possibly with, uh, with the Chinese going forward? Uh, first of you know, we, we could easily uh, have trade relations with many countries around the world. Now, it is unfortunate that the South African government allows a foreign government to bully them in terms of telling them who they should have uh, diplomatic and trade relations with. And I don't think we should allow any nation to influence how foreign policy in terms of trade or dipl dip diplomatic relations. I think we, we, we've seen the, the, the goodwill of the Chinese in terms of uh, assisting South Africans. Uh, we can learn a lot from the Chinese in terms of of they of them developing as a nation 
without any assistance from any Western country or any Western government. Um, and how they've actually gone about uh, in terms of being one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world. I think we can learn a lot from them. And I think we should, should even increase those exchanges in terms of their developmental approaches, uh, the improvement in education. I mean, basic education is compulsory in China. This is streamlined into even bigger intakes into universities and into fields of electronics and engineering. So I don't think we, we should, should even be concerned about the, the countries that are opposed to China when we know what we can benefit from the Chinese. But I'm also saying we must be very cautious never to again change from, from a, where we are dominated in terms of foreign policy by a particular country to where we now are dominated in terms of foreign and local policy by another nation. Mm -hmm. So I just want to touch on, on the South African media. Uh, obviously, the South African media, a lot, of, a lot of the international stories around COVID-19, we do get from other media houses and specifically media houses in the West. Do you think that our media has done enough to mitigate um, kind of just regurgi regurgitating the type of anti-China sentiment that is very often found uh, in other media outlets. So for example, we've seen media outlets uh, refer, uh, you know, in the early days of COVID-19, refer to it as Kung flu or China virus. Um, do you think our media has done enough uh, to curb that? You know, uh, Kung flu and China virus are terms used by the American government and I think that in itself tells South Africans that um, this is wrong. In the American government, the current American president um, can't be very popular amongst Africans. And whatever he says is taken, you know, um, uh, from whence it comes. And coming from the American government, I think it is unfortunate that um, they have uh, deteriorated to such an extent to show such overt racism and um, such overt phobias towards other nations. And I think the, the fact that these sentiments are portrayed in South African media as coming from an American government makes it, um, it has less impact on South Africans who are not very, um, impressed with the current American policies.